The 2022 World Cup was the best World Cup I've ever seen in my life. It had everything from major upsets and Cinderella stories to players having their last dance and even revealing why the future of football was in safe hands. However, that one sentence explanation doesn't do the tournament justice on how truly amazing it was. So today, let's relive some of the iconic 2022 World Cup moments that absolutely show why this was the greatest World Cup of all time. The first reason why this was the best World Cup of all time isn't because of anything that happened on the pitch. In fact, it was the storylines leading up to the tournament. You see, many football fans, including myself, grew up loving the beautiful game in this specific football generation, where we had the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Neymar, Messi, etc. being the faces of the sport. However, this was definitely going to be the last time these superstars were taking the pitch for a World Cup. The legends we grew up watching are all older now and are nearing retirement. During the time of the World Cup, Cristiano Ronaldo was 37 years old, Lionel Messi was 34 years old, Luis Suarez was 35, Gareth Bale was 33 and now retired, Luka Modric was 37, Lewandowski was 34, Eden Hazard was 31 and now retired, Neymar was 30 and has also now said goodbye to his European career so who knows whether he'll represent Brazil in 2026 or not. Point is, we watched these legends grow and mature in this football generation and with them growing older, it seemed like the 2022 World Cup was going to be their last major tournament where they could compete on an elite level. Overall, it seemed like this World Cup was us saying goodbye to the football generation we grew up with and saying hello to the next player stepping up. So with that being said, just due to the storyline, this World Cup was going to be memorable no matter what and the best in my eyes. It's hard to talk about the 2022 World Cup without bringing up the unbelievable run Morocco had at the tournament. Heading into it, nobody except their fans really believed Morocco had what it takes to make the semifinals. You see, at the last 2018 World Cup, Morocco finished dead last in their group, unable to get a win in any of their games, failing to give a positive impression to a large number of football fans who don't really keep up with what's going on in African football. Additionally, three months before the tournament in Qatar, Morocco sacked their head coach Halil Hosic and hired French Moroccan manager Walid Regragui to take over. So with the last minute replacement right before the tournament, nobody really believed in Morocco to make it all the way to the last four. In fact, many people, including myself, thought Morocco would finish dead last in their group, but we couldn't have been more wrong. Now, Morocco were in a very tough group, with them having to play Croatia, the runners up at the last World Cup, Belgium, who got third place in the 2018 edition, and Canada, who have an exciting young generation coming up. But none of this phased Morocco whatsoever. They managed to secure one point in a nil nil draw against Croatia, but after that, Morocco were flawless. Against Belgium, they proved the haters wrong and remarkably beat them 2-0. And then against Canada, they managed to win 2-1. With Morocco managing to get 7 points, they ended up top in the group while remaining undefeated and not conceding a single goal. Well, the only goal they conceded was to Canada and that was because of an unlucky own goal. So really, Morocco didn't concede a real proper goal to an opposing side. Then in the round 16, Morocco had to play another World Cup favorite, Spain, who came off an impressive Euros tournament in the previous summer where they made the semifinals. However, through sheer grit and determination, Morocco stood firm and made it to the penalty shootout, where Bono would force three missed penalties from Spain in order for Morocco to qualify to the quarterfinals, getting Morocco a 3-0 win on penalties. Then, against Portugal in the quarterfinals, a lot of football fans thought this would be the end of the road for Morocco. Portugal were just coming off an impressive 6-1 victory over Switzerland in the round 16, and this result led people to believe that Morocco stood no chance against the young, bright talents of the European country. Plus, with Cristiano Ronaldo also being able to come off the bench, the thought was that there was no way Morocco could overcome such a difficult task. But Morocco did it once once again. They silenced the doubters because in the 42nd minute, and the series jumped up like prime Michael Jordan and headed the ball over the keeper to give the lead to the Moroccans. For the rest of the game, Portugal started to dominate, getting more of the chances and the possession. However, with Morocco standing firm at the back once again, the final whistle blew and Morocco made history. They became the first Arab and African nation to ever qualify for a World Cup semi-final, something no football fan is ever going to forget. Through self-belief, determination, and grit, Morocco silenced the haters, putting up flawless performances against some of Europe's best, including beating Belgium, Spain and Portugal to make it this far. Morocco could have gone further too, but it took the defending 2018 World Cup champions, France, to stop them in their place in the semis. Regardless though, even if Morocco were short of their goal and finished fourth overall at the World Cup, nobody, and I mean nobody, is gonna forget the beautiful Cinderella story that Morocco had in this tournament. To the nation of Morocco, thank you for giving us football fans the best dark horse story the World Cup has ever seen. 
So even though Morocco got all the headlines at the World Cup, the other African countries that were also in the tournament had impressive showings as well, providing hope that even Africa can compete against the highest levels of talent Europe and South America has to offer. First of all, let's start off with Cameroon. Yes, they didn't make it to the round of 16 since they finished third in the group with four points, but they still put on a show for everybody. They barely lost to Switzerland in the first game 1-0, and then in the next game against Serbia, they had one of the most entertaining games at the World Cup when they drew against them 3-3. Now, going into the last game, Cameroon had a chance to make it through, with them having to beat the World Cup favorites, Brazil, by two goals, while Switzerland also having to drop points. It was a nearly impossible task, but it did seem kind of doable. Sadly for Cameroon though, Switzerland ended up defeating Serbia 3-2. Since the games were simultaneous though, Cameroon didn't know that until the final whistle blew. Regardless, Cameroon didn't fear Brazil as much as everybody thought, because towards the ending moments of the game, Vincent Abubakar scored an injury time goal to secure the lead for the Cameroonians, with him proceeding to get a red card for the celebration. The ref also had to give him his respect though. Then, with the final whistle blowing, Cameroon defeated Brazil 1-0 giving Brazil, the five-time World Cup champions and 2022 World Cup favorites, their first ever group stage defeat in the 21st century. Who would have thought that an African country is going to be the ones causing this though? Not me. Who would have thought? Not me. We keep going, because Tunisia did something similar. Making it to the round 16 was also a near impossible task for Tunisia, since they drew to Denmark in the opening game 0-0, and then lost to Australia 1-0 in the following game. So in the last group stage game against France, they would have needed Australia to slip up in their game, while they would have to beat France. Now one part of this ordeal didn't go Tunisia's way, since Australia ended up defeating Denmark in the last group stage game 1-0. However, one part did go Tunisia's way, and that was beating France. That's right, even though France had some great players starting, like Kingsley Coman, Chouameni, Kolomwani, Varane, Kanate, Kimavinga, and even players later on coming in, like Usman Dembele, Griezmann, and Mbappe, Tunisia still ended up beating the 2018 World Cup champions 1 0 on the day. This, along with Cameroon, showed once again that Africa can compete with the highest levels of Europe. But what about South America? Well, Ghana showed that they could compete against the likes of them too. Kind of. You see, Ghana were in a group with Portugal, South Korea, and Uruguay. Yeah, Uruguay. The script writers of the World Cup were cooking with this one. If you didn't know, back in the 2010 World Cup, Ghana could have been the ones to make history by being the first African country to make a semi-final, with Ghana playing Uruguay in the quarters. In the last minute of extra time, while the game was still 1-1, Ghana almost won the game off of a corner kick. However, Luis Suarez cleared the ball off the line, but with his hands, getting himself sent off for his country. Then, with the penalty kick being awarded, Ghana still had an opportunity to make it to the semi-finals, but Asamoah Gyan missed it. Then, in the penalty shootout, Uruguay beat out Ghana and made the semi-finals, knocking Ghana out in the most heartbreaking way possible. The Ghanaians hated the Uruguayans in a sporting way, and they finally had the chance to strike revenge on them at the 20 2022 World Cup. With South Korea beating Portugal, something I'm gonna get on later in this video, all Ghana had to do was to win or draw, or not concede 3 goals to Uruguay to knock them out. And they did exactly that, by only losing 2-0, causing Uruguay to get knocked out in the group stages alongside them. But the Ghanaians were happy, because as long as Uruguay got knocked out, they were chilling. However now, Ghana fans might be on the no enemies arc, after their Uruguay hatred was healed at the 2022 World Cup, not gonna lie. Anyways, with Cameroon, Tunisia, and Ghana, kind of, having memorable 2022 World Cup performances, alongside Senegal making it to the round 16 without their star man Sanyo Mane and Morocco making it to the semifinals, Africa overall had an extremely memorable World Cup, providing hope to African football fans in the future that they can seriously compete at upcoming World Cups and potentially go all the way. Due to this very hope that the African continent provided at this tournament, something that hasn't happened at previous World Cups, is why Africa will have the 2022 World Cup as their best one ever as well. Japan caught a huge case of World Cup fever by the time the tournament came around. But real quick before we get on with Japan though, please remember to subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it and it means a lot, so thank you. And also if you guys can, follow my Twitter and Instagram, both at Nabuto, if you just want to hear my thoughts on football games, transfers, and overall, just to get to know me more. So if you want to, feel free to hit me up with that follow. Thank you. Now back to topic, the Japanese national team has some really talented players that their fans were definitely hyped about, like Takumi Minamino, Takehiro Tomiyasu, Takefusa Kubo, Kaoru Mitoma, etc. But a lot of the hype was due to the fact that this anime called Blue Lock was airing around the same time. Basically, Blue Lock is a soccer slash football style anime where instead of treating the game like it's a team sport, it's about who can have the highest ego and become the best striker Japan has ever seen. Due to the attention that Blue Lock was receiving and that the World Cup was also happening at the same time, Japan had their biggest case of World Cup fever that I've ever personally seen. Also, the Blue Lock collaboration with the Japanese World Cup kits helped too. Regardless, a lot of football fans rode off Japan before the tournament started since they were in a tough group containing 
the likes of Spain, Germany, and Costa Rica. It seemed like initially, people were right to write off Japan, because their first opponents were the relentless Germany, and they went down in the first half thanks to a penalty from Gundogan. With this lead and dominance, it didn't seem like Germany were gonna give it up, since they were looking to relinquish their demons at the last World Cup, where they finished dead last in their group. I mean, come on, look at how Rudiger takes the piss here. You wouldn't do that unless you were confident that your country was gonna win. But karma caught up to Rudiger and the rest of the German national team, because just like protagonists in anime, Japan never gave up. Late into the game, in the 75th minute, super sub Minamino comes on and takes a shot at Neuer, which he parries away. However, Richard Doan, the Freiburg winger, and also the guy who kind of resembles Kunigami from Blue Lock due to the same color hair, gets on the rebound and scores a goal to tie up the game for the Japanese. Then in the 83rd minute, Japanese forward, Takuma Asano, perfectly brought down the ball from a pass, and then ended up finishing the playoff beautifully, giving Japan a late lead from 1-0 down to 2-1 up in a short span of 8 minutes. This anime MC protagonist-esque performance got Japan one of their biggest upsets at the World Cup, and also a crucial 3 points in the 2022 edition. You just know that the Japan manager, Hajime Moriyasu, gave an Erwin style halftime talk in that game. My soldiers push forward! My soldiers scream out! My soldiers run! With this incredible win over Germany, the streets were fully expecting Japan to take care of business against a much weaker side Costa Rica, who got spanked by Spain 7-0 in the previous match. But Japan made it hard on themselves, somehow losing 1-0 to the Costa Ricans. To this day, I still don't understand how Japan fumbled that. Regardless, Japan were put in a difficult situation, where the only way they can make it to the round 16 is to draw and also hope Germany draws to Costa Rica or beat the group leader Spain. Japan though, wanted to control their own destiny, and they did exactly that. First though, in the 11th minute of the game, Game, Alvaro Morata got an early goal to give the Spaniards a 1-0 lead, and this lead stayed all the way until halftime. But of course, Japan manager Moriyasu definitely whipped out another Erwin style halftime talk. Your heart and soul to the top! Because in the second half, Japan came out firing. Three minutes into the second half, Rutsu Doan, or should I say Kunigami, hit a belter from outside the box to equalize the game for Japan. But a draw didn't last long. Because in the 51st minute, three minutes after the first goal, the most anime moment ever happened for Japan at the tournament. You see, the ball seemed to be heading out for a Spain goal kick. But Mitoma lunged at the ball, managed to cross it back into the box, and Ao Tonaka hit it in. Initially though, the goal was disallowed, since it seemed like the ball passed the entire line before Mitoma crossed it back in. But after VAR into interference, the ball stayed on the pitch by 1.88 milliliters by the time Itoma got it, meaning the ball never went out, counting Japan's second goal. That's the most clutch anime goal I've ever seen in my life. How fitting for it to happen to the country that created anime, Japan. That's not it though, because the dude who got the assist for the second goal, Kaoru Mitoma, and the dude who scored, Ao Tanaka, were actually really good childhood friends who went to the same elementary school in Kawasaki, Japan. The World Cup scriptwriters were cooking once again. They were trying to make an anime moment in real life and succeeded. This is literally some Luffy Zoro shit, some Hina not that Kageyama shit, some Deku Bakugo shit, some Gojo Ghetto shit before Ghetto switched up, but I'm getting off topic. The point is, this second goal in particular might be the most anime style goal of all time. Not only that, this second goal for Japan was the reason why Japan even made the round 16, since they ended up defeating Spain 2-1, topping the group and sending Germany back home in the group stages for the second consecutive time. Now yes, Japan low-key sold against Croatia on penalties, losing 3-1 in the penalty shootout while missing 3 penalties themselves. But Croatia are the 2018 World Cup runners up, and also the eventual 3rd place medalist at the 2022 World Cup. So in the grand scheme of things, this isn't that embarrassing. Still though, regardless of Japan's round of 16 exit, the streets will never forget how Japan took over social media with their games against Germany and Spain, and how TikTok at the time was covered with the sound. If you know, you know. Seriously though, Japan made their nation and the world proud, and proved to themselves that they can also compete with elite European teams at the best World Cup ever, the 2022 World Cup, making it probably Japan's best World Cup ever as well. So even though Japan had the most attention at the 2022 World Cup, the entire continent of Asia actually had an incredibly impressive performance at the tournament. Let's start this off with Saudi Arabia. The rich Middle Eastern country caused maybe the biggest upset in World Cup history in the opening game. You see, Saudi Arabia were set to face off Lionel Messi and Argentina, one of the clear favorites to go on and win the World Cup. And in the first half, Saudi Arabia were completely dominated, with Messi scoring a penalty and there being like three barely offside goals from Argentina that VAR had to disallow. So by the time halftime came around, Argentina could have been winning this game like 3-0 or 4-0. However, during halftime, Saudi Arabia's coach at the World Cup, Herb Renard, gave an epic halftime talk, motivating the Saudi Arabian players to stop looking at Messi and awe and start attacking Argentina in the second half. I guess you could say, he also gave an Erwin style halftime talk. My soldiers push forward! My soldiers scream! Haha, <laughs> man, I really gotta stop with this Erwin stuff. 
Anyways, in the second half, things turn around for Saudi Arabia. In the 48th minute, Salah Asheri scored a great goal with the country's first shot on target to tie the game. Then, five minutes later in the 53rd minute, Salem Aldaswari scored one of the goals of the tournament, scoring a belter and giving Saudi Arabia a 2-1 lead, something they would hold on until the final whistle blew. So, in the opening game for Lionel Messi's quest to win the World Cup, they were defeated by Saudi Arabia 2-1, an incredible shock for everybody watching the tournament. The reaction for the Saudi Arabian people was crazy too. I mean, this dude was literally shooting an AK-47 after the win. Also, this viral video came after the win too, and I'm sure everybody remembers this one. Overall though, this was an incredible win for Saudi Arabia, and something everybody will remember. However, the rest of the World Cup for the country wasn't all that, with them losing 2-0 to Poland due to their own defensive mistakes, and then losing to Mexico 2-1, which ended up in Saudi Arabia being bottom of the group. However, the streets will never forget that win against Argentina. Moving on, let's talk about Australia, who are technically in Oceania, geographically, but play their football in the Asian region, so they're representing Asia in my books. The World Cup campaign actually started pretty good, because on the same day where Saudi Arabia upset Argentina, Australia got a 1-0 lead against defending World Cup champions France in the opening match. It felt like we were going to get two ridiculous upsets in just one day. But reality struck, and France ended up creaming all over Australia 4-1. But Australia weren't going to be phased by this tough loss to a top 3 side in the world. They still had hope if they beat the following two opponents in the group, and that's what they did. In the game against Tunisia, Australia ended up getting a 1-0 win, securing their first 3 points at the tournament. And then against Denmark, Australia had to get a win to secure a 2nd place finish in the group. And that's what they did, like I said. They to Matthew Lecky, who scored in the 60th minute of the game to send the Australians through to the round of 16 for the first time since 2006. The thing is though, in the round of 16, Australia had to play against Argentina, where Messi put up a masterclass and got his country the win. But Australia played well, and even started to dominate way later into the game, with Australia getting a crazy deflection goal, and then almost had the chance of sending it to extra time thanks to the Australian winner kid, Garan Kuo. But Emiliano Martinez saved Argentina big time. Regardless, Australia could hold their heads up high for putting up a great performance overall at the 20 2022 World Cup. Now let's go over to South Korea, a country that had a crazy underdog performance. Way crazier than what happened with Australia. Buckle in because this is about to get insane. Initially, South Korea was not having a World Cup they wanted to remember. The first game was a dead nil nil draw against Uruguay, but then in the next game against Ghana, they lost 3 2 in the very back and forth game. So, like I said, it wasn't looking too good for South Korea. But it was looking good for this BTS pretty boy looking dude, Cho Gyo Sung, whose two goals skyrocketed his popularity, especially with the females, because that gender specifically played a major role in boosting his Instagram followers from 46,000 to over 1.5 million in just a span of a couple weeks. Besides for him though, South Korea were really in the mud, and they only had a slim chance of progressing through to the knockout round. A lot of things had to go their way if they wanted to go through. Let me explain. After the two games, these were the standings, with Portugal in first, Ghana in second, South Korea in third, and Uruguay in fourth. The games that were still to be played were Portugal versus South Korea, and then the heated Ghana versus Uruguay. So with Portugal already having two wins at this time, with that beating Ghana 3-2 and Uruguay 2 no, they were already through to the round of 16 no matter what happens. So that means there's only one spot remaining for the other three countries. Now Ghana were already in second with three points, meaning if they won the game against Uruguay, no matter what happens in the Portugal-South Korea game, they were going through since they would have six points higher than any points South Korea could get. But if Uruguay wins and South Korea loses, Uruguay would go through since they would have four points which would be more than South Korea and Ghana. But the only way for South Korea to go through is to be a very talented Portugal team and then hope Uruguay beats Ghana but not by three or more goals because goals for would take Uruguay through instead. This is basically a summary for all the scenarios that could have happened. But TLDR, South Korea had a very slim chance of going through. But guess what? Uruguay only beat Ghana by two goals, meaning South Korea just had to beat Portugal. But by the time injury time started, South Korea were drawn to Portugal 1-1, meaning they would be heading out of the tournament. But after a Portuguese corner, Hyomi Son had the ball, and he started running the length of the pitch by himself against the three Portuguese defenders. But with Hwang Hee Chan, the South Korean striker making the run, Hyomi Son decides to pass the ball through the legs of the Portuguese defenders. And Huang Yee Chan finishes the chance off, giving South Korea a 2-1 lead and eventually sending them through to the round of 16. Seeing this live on my TV was insane. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. So with Asia being represented well with the likes of Japan, Australia, and South Korea making the round of 16, also Saudi Arabia upsetting the eventual World Cup champions Argentina in the first game 2-1, and even Iran putting up a great shift at the tournament despite the serious off the pitch stuff happening in the country, Asia as a whole put up their best World Cup performance ever. Let's completely ignore Qatar's performance though, we don't need to talk about that. Now Asia showed, just like Africa, that they can compete with the world's best, and maybe in the future World Cups, they can go all the way. Overall though, with many underdog stories from Africa and Asia, something the World Cup hasn't seen until now, is one of the main reasons why this World Cup was the best one ever.
Lionel Messi, one of the greatest footballers, if not the greatest, to ever grace the beautiful game. He's accomplished it all on the club level. He won multiple La Ligas, Copa del Reyes, Club World Cups, UEFA Super Cups, Champions Leagues, Ballon d'Ors, etc. There was nothing left for Messi to accomplish at the club level. But for the longest time, the international level was a different story, with Messi and Argentina continuously missing out on international silverware. However, the Messi International Trophy curse was finally gone in the summer of 2021, with Argentina finally winning the Copa America and then the Finalissima against Italy one summer later. But the big one was still left, something Messi hasn't won yet, the World Cup. But in 2014, he had the chance to take it home. At the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, Messi and Argentina made the World Cup final, where they would have to face a dominating and scary Germany side. But safe to say, Argentina had their fair share of chances to win the game, but Higuain had the biggest fumble of all time. Seriously, how do you squander an opportunity like this on the world's biggest stage? Regardless, the game had to go to extra time, where Messi would still have an opportunity to seize the biggest trophy of them all, the World Cup. But it just wasn't meant to be. With super sub Mario Gotze scoring the World Cup final goal, to give Germany the World Cup. This obviously meant that Messi lost his best chance at the time to win the World Cup. In the post-game celebrations, you can clearly see how devastated and distraught he was, knowing he just let his best chance of winning the World Cup slip away. It seemed like this was going to haunt Messi for the rest of his playing days. But the world works in mysterious ways, because after years of incompetence in the back for Argentina, they were blessed for the 2022 World Cup, with the likes of Emi Martinez, Lissandro Martinez, Christian Romero, Daniel Fico, Molino, etc. coming into the fold. With a talented offense and defense now, the 2022 World Cup could actually be Messi's best and last chance to win the World Cup trophy and seal off Messi's wonderful career. Going into the first game, Argentina were confident. They hadn't lost in three years. Surely, they weren't going to lose to the likes of Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah, it didn't start off hot for Argentina, but Messi assured the fans after the game to continue to believe in the team and that they wouldn't abandon them, and Messi was a man of his word. In the second game against Mexico, Argentina basically had to win in order to make sure that they had the best chance to top the group. Anything other than a win was going to be seen as a failure, but for around 60 minutes of the match, it seemed like the game was going to end in a nil-nil draw, making the road to the knockout rounds way more difficult for Argentina. But in the 64th minute, Messi turned into Hemity, Hemi Neutron, him, and scored an outrageous goal from outside the box to get a much needed lead against Mexico. Then by the end of the game, with a 2-0 win, Messi might have saved Argentina's World Cup campaign. Eventually, thanks to a 2-0 win over Poland, Argentina ended up topping the group after their sluggish start and had to face Australia in the round 16. I already went over this game, so I'll keep it brief. Argentina ended up winning 2-1 and Messi got himself his first ever World Cup knockout round goal, something Cristiano Ronaldo to this day doesn't have. That wasn't a diss either, I swear. I was just trying to mention it out of fact. Anyways, the quarterfinal match versus the Netherlands came up and who knew this was going to turn into such a spicy affair? Messi's penalty in the 73rd minute gave Argentina a 2-0 lead, but thanks to Vegors clutching up in the 83rd minute, and then due to the large amount of injury time, thanks to Paredes kicking the ball into the Netherlands bench, causing a huge fight between the two sides. This caused Vegors to clutch up again in the 90 plus 11th minute, scoring the goal to draw the game. The game was then set to penalties, where Emiliano Martinez would clutch up with two saves, and Lothar Martinez sent the Argentines through to the semi-finals. There, they would find Croatia, but Messi's masterclass performance would carry Argentina to the final against the 2018 World Cup champions, and Messi's PSG teammate at the time, Kylian Mbappe. This game could have gone either way. Both sides were giants in their own respective rights, and both countries had a really talented squad. However, for the majority of regular time, it was all Argentina. It started with Usman Nabele fouling Di Maria in the box, giving Argentina a penalty in which, of course, Messi slotted away in the 23rd minute. Then in the 36th minute, a brilliant counterattack from Argentina occurred, and Di Maria hit the ball into the ground from his shot and slotted away another goal for the Argentines, giving them a 2-0 advantage. From here on out, it felt like Argentina were going to win the World Cup easily, and they seemed to be cruising by for the the rest of the game. That was until the 80th minute, where substitute Colomwani won a penalty for Mbappe to take. And of course, the French Starbuck capitalized on this opportunity, bringing the game to one. Even then though, it felt like this might have been a little too late, but nothing was too late for Mbappe, because literally one minute later in the 81st minute, a series of passes occurred for France in the opposing half, and the last pass fell to Mbappe, where he pulled out his inner Asagi and hit it sweetly into the net, bringing the game level in just one minute. Mbappe sent shivers down my spine, because I was rooting for Argentina, and let me tell you, in this instant, I had never felt more scared for Messi in my life. If Argentina choked this World Cup, Messi's story would have a Game of Thrones ending. Just pure or dog sh but in extra time, in the 108th minute, Messi would show why he's him once again. And after a French bunda kept Lothar Martinez onside, Messi got the rebound of his shot and scored the goal to give Argentina a 3-2 lead in the game. Messi clutching out like this would have been a beautiful way to end the game. But it wasn't, because France won another penalty. And of course, the star boy himself, Mbappe, stepped up to the plate. And of course, again, Mbappe wouldn't be phased and hit it so well into the back of the net, getting himself a hat-trick in the World Cup final, the only man to do it besides Pele, and bringing the game level 3-3 and into a penalty shootout. But 
but they saw Emiliano Martinez's antics and shithousery that even Mbappe's hat-trick could bring home the victory for France. And instead, Argentina were the ones to win the World Cup in spectacular fashion. At this moment though, Mbappe showed why the next generation of football is in safe hands. However, in the greatest World Cup of all time, Lionel Messi carried his country all the way to the World Cup, ending the GOAT debate for many football fans out there, including myself, and ending his story in the most beautiful way possible. What a fitting ending for a football legend everybody should forever remember and adore, Lionel Messi. The World Cup scriptwriters were cooking once again, and with a GOAT ending like this, there is no way this can't be the best World Cup of all time, unless you're a Ronaldo fan. This part's a little more personal, but this was the very first World Cup that I've ever attended, making this one the most special to me. I even vlogged most of my experience there if you guys were curious. But basically, as a kid, I've always wanted to attend the World Cup, and after the 2018 edition ended, I made a promise to myself that I was going to attend every World Cup possible until I grow old and slow. And the 2022 version was the first time I could make this dream a possibility. So I saved up a good chunk of money, and by the time the World Cup came around, I had the funds to make one of my biggest dreams possible and witness a World Cup live. For every football fan that's still watching this video, I strongly urge you to start saving up and trying to go to a World Cup for yourself. There's nothing like this. Talking to people all across the world, making bonds, enjoying the highest level of football games possible, this all I want package is something everyone should experience. So if you were still unsure whether or not you want to go to a World Cup and save that much money, you should start saving up for real. And who knows, maybe you can see me and say hi at one of these future World Cups. Anyways, if you guys enjoyed this video, please remember to subscribe, I would really appreciate it. Also, please be sure to follow my Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch. The links are in my YouTube description. And last but not least, if you want to learn more about Morocco's World Cup 2022 run and how they bounced back from some really tough times in the early 2010s, you definitely want to check out this video right here. You won't regret it.